Griffin. Welcome to the Different Take Podcast. If you like this content, please subscribe, like, share, comment. Really appreciate you watching. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with David Cross. David is a resident of Gwinnett County, Georgia. He's a financial advisor. He's been working uh, in that industry for 30 years. His firm is U.S. Management. Uh, did I get that right? U.S. Asset Management. Sorry, U.S. Asset Management. I became acquainted uh, somewhat as uh, David uh, testified in the Georgia State Senate regarding the election of 2020 and got involved with Verger GA and in investigating what happened in 2020. And he's very familiar with um, the data and the, what's going on with the how voting is done today in the digital age. He's much more knowledgeable about that than anybody else I know. And uh, you had some news regarding a ruling, Supreme Court ruling yesterday. And yeah, we so we'll just start with that. Yeah, so we, we've got some really big news. So the the there was a case that that's involved where um, a guy named Garland Favorito and several other uh, plaintiffs had made a case against Fulton County and the Secretary of State in an effort to try and in, it, in an effort to be be able to try and just see Fulton County's ballots because we knew that there were so many problems with it, and the case was uh, was slogging along very slowly. With, uh, with Judge Brian Amaro, um, I think down in Henry County. And Judge Amaro kind of chickened out and he ended up throwing the case out on standing. And for those that don't know, standing just means that the, the court has determined that you as a plaintiff don't have a particularized injury, meaning you can't quantify like your dollar amount of damages. And if that's the case, then, then they say, see you later. And they threw the, threw the case out. And so we appealed it, it went to the appeals court, then it went from the appeals court to the to the Supreme Court. And yesterday, the Supreme Court came down uh, with, the, with a ruling yesterday morning and said, yes, um, they do not, you know, the plaintiff does not, does no longer have to prove standing in order for the case to proceed. So kick it back down to Judge Amaro, pick up where you left off, and let's see how this thing ends. So it's, it's huge news. What's what's the substance of the lawsuit? The substance of the lawsuit is that we, when we investigated what was happening with with Fulton County, there we, was, if you don't mind me interrupting, we as Voter GA, which is a activist group, and yeah, so so vo Voter GA is um it's it's a uh, it's it's a voter election integrity group that's that's all about just trying to make sure that that elections are handled properly it's been around for 20 years so it's not it's not some johnny come lately but i got involved with them back in 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 2020 when we initially started seeing what i what i what i thought was just strange happenings in you know in the election in georgia and the case the case was really was really centered on fulton county and the maladministration of what had happened with their election so when I say maladministration, what I'm talking about is we we had people on the ground, we had poll observers that were out there, we had election, um, we had you know we had um, election uh, observers that saw that there were a lot of irregularities, and some of those irregularities included seeing ballots that were stacked up like like you just took paper like out of a fresh ream. Uh, and ballots that that look just like that that were you know that were being being run through and counted and we know that that's impossible because mail in ballots have to go through the mail they end up being folded you know four times or th or three times is where they, they have three folds in the paper so our our case was all about being able to inspect the mail in ballots 145,000 of them is what we were trying to see and you would think that with the transparency in, in our election laws and how much the secretary of state says that he's all for transparency, that he wouldn't fight us. But in fact, he fought us every step of the way. Um, and they brought in lawyers from Perkins Coey to, to help out with, with Fulton County. Fulton County is bringing in criminal defense lawyers against our one little guy you know, that was, that was fighting it out in, in Henry County. And they were just going to beat us to death with their checkbook. And it's it's what we call it's what we call um, lawfare, where you're just fighting with dollar bills. And they obviously had more dollar bills than us, and they they just they just ran it out. And I think they just exhausted the judge. But the the whole point of the of the case was to, to was to be able to see the paper balance and be able to reconcile them against what the actual vote was, because as it stands right now, 
we're only told that, you know, you can't have access to the paper ballots. You can only see the, the ballot images that were created by the Dominion system. And what we found out was that Fulton County um, accidentally deleted 315,000 ballot images. So they don't exist. So <laughs> what am I supposed to compare them to? And they said, oh, no, no, we're going to give you the ballot images from the recount that we did in December. That'll be good enough. And that's 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 the that's the kind of nonsense that we're dealing with with, with Fulton County. So what happens at, at this point? And this this has been this is from the 2020 election. It's been dragging on for two years. What what happens? What happens at this point? So what, what's going to happen now is it's going to get kicked back down into Judge Amaro's court. Um, and then he'll see some of he'll he'll see the evidence that, that we've collected about the ballot images that, that were deleted, um, the security images that were deleted, the inconsistencies that we've seen with with reported numbers. And any reasonable judge is going to say, OK, go go see the ballots, go go, you know, go take a look at them and. They should still they should still be there because Fulton County was given a non spoliation letter that said that they have to preserve the evidence. Whether or not they actually followed it is an, is another question. So I mean, yeah, I clearly have got my doubts. I mean, I hope they did, but um, you know, the, but the way the way elections work in Georgia is that we're supposed to retain these ballots. The paper ballots are supposed to be retained for twenty four months, and unfortunately, during that time. Nobody ever gets to see them. And I was joking around with a friend a couple of days ago, and I said, you know what? After we have an election, like when we just had in, in December, they should just go ahead and burn them or shred them. Nobody's ever going to get to see them anyway. So what's the point of keeping them? So I'm a little bit jaded, you know, a little bit cynical, but hopefully Fulton County has still got these things, and we will actually be able to go through and count and compare and see if things actually truly line up. And you know, this inspection would have held a lot more weight if we could have done it immediately after the election, but it's been nearly two years. So anything could have happened, you know, to those ballots between now and then. It, anybody, I mean, the, the government's had plenty of time to go through and, and see if anything, you know, was out of, um, you know, was was out of sorts with it or needed to be corrected or reprinted or whatever, or just, or toss them out. So that's kind of where we're at right now. What is motivating the Secretary of State to have this uh, kept from the public? Um, do you think? You know, it's here's the thing with with Brad Raffensperger. It's either one of two things: either he's an idiot, and I don't think the man's an idiot. I mean, he's he's worth north of thirty million dollars. He's he's got a successful you know engineering company. I don't think he's a fool. I think what what it comes down to is probably pride. Nobody wants to be told that their that their engineering miracle that they put together for voting systems um, is an ugly baby. Nobody wants to hear that they got an ugly baby. And I think more than anything else, he's kind of dug his heels in, and he's unwilling. There, there's some people in the world that are just unwilling to admit when they're wrong, and and I think he's one of those people. What are the big problems with the the voting? Let me back up a second. I, I, so my original voting experience was you voted with a machine, you voted in private, you showed up the day of voting, you have to wait a terribly long time, and you would have to wait in line. You go in, you flip levers, you know what's paper, you can hear people behind the, the uh, curtain. You know your vote's getting counted that night, um, you know, a Republican's going and a Democrat's going to look at it because you hear the people. <laughs> so I, I had a lot more faith in that than I'm going into an, a machine two weeks before it's counted, and it's a it's a machine. I mean, it's not. There's I don't know what happens <laughs> after that. So you've got that, and then you also have. The voting by mail, which is suspect for me because I could vote for, you know, my kids. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a national TV personality that admitted she voted for a kid. That's how that that's what it's come to. So anyway, right. I, I know I went into a little bit there, but 
what is what is wrong with the current system as opposed to my experience or maybe my experience was uh, you know maybe there were problems with that irregularities with that too well here, here's the thing there, so there's a documentary that was done just recently about the different voting systems that have been in use for like the last 50 years the machines that you're talking about where you went in and voted and you cranked the wheel and all that kind of thing and, it, and the, the output was like a little card and the card would get you know would get red those things were manipulated too. The politicians in those, day, those days, they were they were shaving down the wheels and making it so that you know so that your vote didn't count for exactly what you thought it was going to count for. And you know, and when then when we had the the hanging Chad issue that happened, you know, with with Bush, Bush versus Gore down in you know down in Florida, um, you know that that just sent everybody into a tailspin and said, oh my gosh, we we need to adopt this technology. We need to like you know we need to adopt the, you know, digital technology. And it just made it even worse. So I agree with, with, with what you just said about, you know, you know there, there was a time when ballots, I think, were actually counted properly. And the way that it was done was you were given like an old fashioned piece of paper. You, you know, you put a check mark next to the person you wanted to vote for. You circled them, you know, or whatever. And, and people went through and, and they counted, you know, they counted ballots that way. I would personally trust 10th and 11th graders to count our ballots more than I more than i trust the machines that are that are currently counting counting what we've got right now because a 10th or 11th grader can't keep a secret i mean if, if a politician tries to buy off a 10th grader you know with hey i'll give you a thousand bucks if you give me extra votes a 10th grader is not gonna be able to keep their mouth shut <laughs> they'll, they'll get found out pretty quick so you know i you know it'll be i think it'd be a great civics lesson you know for kids to see you know how you know a, a, a democratic republic works um so that that's one thing now on to like What's the, the name of the documentary, by the way? Um, I'm going to have to look it up. My wife told me about it, and I've seen so many things I can't remember right this second, but I, I will send okay. it to you, post it later. But, um, but you know, so where where we are right now in Georgia, Georgia is very different from like a state like Vermont. All right, so Vermont uses Dominion systems to count ballots up there also, but when somebody from Vermont, you know, goes in to to cast their ballot, they've either already been mailed a ballot or they can pick up a ballot at the polling place they mark their selections on their ballot and then the ballot gets you get scanned into the machine now that doesn't sound terribly different from what we have here the biggest difference in georgia is that when you go in to vote you're you're voting on something called a bmd a ballot marking device all right and that's a little tv screen that you you, know, you put the little card on the bottom and you're touching on the screen like who, who you're voting for and what most people don't understand is that that is, you know, that is a um, what you I, I guess, it, you know, I don't know if this is a, the words are correct or not, but it's a handicap assist device. It's not meant to be the primary voting method. Right. And what happens is in Georgia, you go in and you touch the screen for who you're going to vote for. The computer has to make an interpretation of where your finger landed on there. So the computer has to interpret who you're voting for. And then before it casts your ballot, it's going to reinterpret your votes and put that into a QR code that neither you nor I can read. And there's no commercial devices that will read it. But that's the second interpretation of your vote that then get, that gets turned into a QR code. Then your ballot gets printed out and then you go put it into a scanner. And then the scanner has to uninterpret the, the QR code to determine what your vote is. Why do we have to have three interpretations or two interpretations and one, you know, and one uninterpretation of, of how you're of how you're voting in order to in order to register what your voter intent is? It's just it's it's unnecessary steps. Um so it's, it's, it's a it's a very cumbersome, it's a very cumbersome thing. I call it, it to me, it's an unnecessary digital abomination that costs millions of dollars every year that um, Gwinnett County voters and no other county, you know, no other um, county residents ever voted for because it's a, it's an expense. It's a, it is a permanent expense of running the county. And the state constitution of Georgia says that permanent expenses on a county level have to be approved by the voters. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems as if it's a very cumbersome system to administer. It is. I mean, I've seen the voting, the the voting workers handbooks, and it, it's 
it's pretty thick. It's a thick thing. It's not real. It's not simple. Right. 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 So I, you know, it's it's funny on the on the Friday before this most recent election, um, Gwinnett County called me and said, "Hey, um, you si you signed up that you would that you'd be a you know an election worker. Are you still available?" And I said, "I didn't expect you to call, but sure. How can I help?" And they said, "Awesome. We need for you to be a poll manager." And I said, "I've never done anything." And they said, "That's okay. We'll send you to training." I was like, all right, well, when's training? Tomorrow at three o'clock from three until six on a Saturday. So I went, I went to the training. I was late for my, you know, for my daughter's birthday. Um, and then, um, and then I was notified on Sunday that I had two assistant managers that were working with me. One was a, was a wonderful lady from, uh, from Loganville who had never worked as a, you know, as an assistant manager, she was being asked to, to work. And a young man from Snellville who was 16 years old, he's a, and he, he's a, he's a junior at the, you know, at the STEM high school. And he was asked and none of us have ever worked, you know, a, a poll. So anyway, we all went through training. We open up the poll. We were going through the close down process. And as we're going through the close down process, we're trying to follow this jumbled mix of, of instructions on how to do things. It's very confusing. It's unnecessarily complex. And there was a lady who was my, you know, area manager. She came, you know, back to see us after the poll closed to help us close things down. And she was telling me, okay, this document goes here. This gets sealed in here. This goes here. She was telling us exactly how to do it. And then when I took it up to Gwinnett County and turned it in at like 10, 15 or 10, 30, whatever it was, um, the Gwinnett County folks were like, why did you put this in here you know, like this? And why did you not do this? And, and I was like, I just followed the instructions of the, of the expert, you know, <laughs> who came from, who came from the County to help me close it down. So, you know, if a college educated person who's really very interested in understanding the process can't figure out, you know, how you're supposed to, or, or even can't follow the instructions that they've created because the instructions are incomplete of how to open and close a poll. I know that if we didn't do it properly, nobody else did it properly either. And it's not for, it's not for lack of wanting to, it's because it's an unnecessarily complex, you know, system that's been put together. And the reality is, is, I mean, I had to wake up at four 30 that morning. I didn't get home until 10 30 that night. So what is that a 17 or 18 hour day or whatever it is. That's crazy. We, uh, that that makes no sense. I mean, our our grandparents, you know, didn't vote that way. And for but in what was the average wait time for a voter <laughs> at our place? Yeah. Zero minutes. It was exactly zero minutes. We at the at the poll that I served at, um, we had three hundred and fifty votes that day. It would have been so much easier just to just to have a list of the number of the people who were eligible to vote in our precinct check and see if their name was on the list. If they were on the list, here's your ballot. Here's a piece of paper. When you're done with it, go put it in that clear Lexan box over there. We'll count it, you know, at the end of the day and we'll have Gwinnett County double check our account. That's how, that's how it ought to be done, but that's not how it is done. It seems the cost to administer these, the elections are far greater than they were 20 or before uh, using the, 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 the voting machines that are commonplace now. Yeah. It seems that way to me, but I, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I mean, there, there are millions and millions and millions of dollars that they're used. I mean, when I had to go pick up, when I had to go pick up the equipment, you know, there's an entire warehouse in Gwinnett County that houses all of this material. And it is only used. My understanding is it's only used for, for election, for election equipment. So again, that, that is a fixed cost that that the, the you know that the the county residents are being asked to pay for that that nobody ever approved so what did you see what were some of the some of the irregularity other irregularities you saw from the 2020 election um 
There's there's a lot. So um, a, an easy place to see a lot of this stuff, if, if people are interested, is they can go to a website I created where we just, I've got like, it's called the evidence locker. <laughs> you just Every time we find something, we put it in there. But the, the website is www.gaballots.com, like Georgia ballots, gaballots.com. Um, you know, so here, so one of the things I, that I mentioned before is that Fulton County cannot find 315,000 ballot images. They just vanished. Across the state of Georgia, there's 1.7 million missing ballot images. And believe it or not, Georgia state law says that each one of those missing images is a thousand dollar fine. So that's $1.7 billion of liability. But you know, no law enforcement or anybody's doing any, you know anything about that. Um, total on, media blackout, also. Yeah, to, total media blackout. Um, Raffensburger. We so we spoke about Raffensburger a couple minutes ago. On the day after the election, he went on the on the Today Show, and and he and he said that you know Georgia has had a record turnout. It's even way bigger than it was in in 2016. We've had about 4.7 million people who have voted in Georgia. And most people would hear that number and be like, wow, that, that's that's huge turnout. And, and it is. But what most people don't know is that he said there's 4.7 million ballots. We've only got 2% of those ballots left to count. Not 2% more, 2% of those ballots le left to count. All right. And the final tally number for Georgia ballots in the state of Georgia was 4.99 million ballots. So nearly 300,000 additional ballots just appeared across the state out of thin air. And he's never he's never addressed it. that. He's never tried to explain, you know, what, you know what happened with it. Is that partly because the media just doesn't they don't they totally miss it or they just ignore that big, that's a huge number. It's a, it is a huge number. Um, I, I honestly think that in, I think the media in Georgia doesn't want to hear it. So you've got, um, you've got PBS. Um, so th there's a, there's a guy named, I think his name is Stephen Fowler that work, works for PBS. He might as well be, you know, the state of Georgia's lap dog. I mean, his, his job is just to go and make Raffensperger and the governor look fantastic. All right. Then you've got Mark Nisi over at the Atlanta Journal, who I have given him untold volumes of information of the things that, that we've shown them. And he has printed up exactly zero uh, words about anything that I've given him. So in, in Georgia, it's it, it is um, it's it's media that is just ignoring the facts. What's different about the procedures in 22 and uh, 2020. Improvements, so, the so improvements or the other. So, way. so, so, there, so, so there's a couple things. The, the first one, the, mo the most, the most notable is that there are so many people that were upset that got activated by you know and wanted to do their part and get involved in the civic processes that you had a lot of people who in the past would not normally be involved in you know in their local elections going to get trained and becoming poll workers and, and, and becoming, you know, part of what's going on. We also saw a lot of, a lot of other people that, that said, you know what, I want to be a poll observer. I want to go, you know, go see that things are being done properly. So I think what really happened was 2020 just woke up a lot of the, a lot of the population that said, you know what, I, I think that what happened before, I don't think it was, I don't think it was entirely kosher. And, and I, I want to, I want to become part of the solution instead of just complaining about it. So that, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing, which is a little bit more, you know, which is a, a quite a bit more minor, is that um, the drop boxes that were that were so prevalent in 2020, the vast majority of them uh, were taken out. So counties either had no drop boxes or they had just one drop box. Or they had or they had a very very small number that had to be. Um, housed inside government facilities. So we went from, you know, the, the drop boxes that we had in 2020, Bill, I mean, it, you know, we've got the vast majority of them for Gwinnett County alone. I mean, I'll just tell you, Gwinnett County had the best video of anybody in the country for drop boxes, but it came in four different formats and it came on 32 terabytes 
of, of data storage devices. So, you know, even if I wanted to house it someplace so the whole world could look at it, it's impossible to do it because your average person is not going to understand like how to, you know, how to run the software on those things. Um, but we've, we've come down, you know, quite a bit, you know, from, from those numbers. And I think, and I, I hope that the, that the, that the ballot harvesting and that kind of thing has dropped significantly. But one thing that, um, that your viewers need to understand that we, that we just discovered a couple of days ago was with regard to drop boxes and who can actually drop off a ballot for a voter. Um, earlier this year and last year, I was working under, you know, looking at, at Georgia, you know, state law that showed, you know, what, you know, what can be done. And I was looking, I, I remember the 2018 law and I figured nobody's oh, changed it, you know, and I didn't, I didn't even understand that, 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 that they, that they had updated it. But in 2019, six words were taken out of one sentence in a piece of Georgia code that made it so that anybody could deliver a ballot for anybody else. You know, if you just had like a remote connection to that person, you know, they were your, you know, uh, other than family, your, your caregiver, you know, for all I know, Bill, if you go get me some aspirin, you're my caregivers, right. you can deliver my ballot for me. So, um, but that, you know, the big, I think the biggest thing was that we saw a lot more people interested, activated, um, you know, becoming part of trying to figure out like what's going on and trying to help secure our elections. There's, there's video and a lot of people don't understand this. There's videos. I mean, you may, uh, uh, I'm curious to see if you've seen anything um, similar or worse say someone is at the Dropbox with an array of envelopes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had big handful stack of envelopes and they're taking a selfie at the Dropbox to prove to someone that they're put, they're putting those particular ballots in the, in the box, which this would have been, uh, I may be uh, crazy, but this same scandalous, well, we, 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 30 I've years got, ago, that seems scandalous to me, but uh, that's commonplace now. Well, right? I've, we've, we've got it on video in, in Gwinnett County over at uh, when there was a drop box in 2020 in uh, at the Swanee Library. I've got I've got video of a guy. He's holding out 14 ballots, you know, and you know, taking a picture in front of the ballot box and then drops the ballots in. Um, I've got it's in 2020 or. Yeah. Yeah, that's for the, for the for the 2020 you know general election in November 2020. I've got another video in November 2020 of a of a lady who walks up with so many ballots. Um, she looks like she's got like a loaf of bread, and she's she puts about 30 ballots you know into a drop box, you know. And both of those you know both of those instances I've reported to the Secretary of State's website, and an investigator got back to me on the lady who puts 30 ballots in. And he said, you know, I didn't see it that way. She, and I said, well, how many ballots do you think she put in there? And he said, well, it looked to me like five. You, is there a reason for people not to or to have doubts? Or is it unreasonable to doubt the machines that people are using? Because that was a big issue in 2020. Yeah, I, I mean, I honestly don't know if you can trust the machines. Um, there's, there's so many, there's so many ways to, you know, to hack them, to hack them and compromise them that, uh, a guy named Alex Halderman wrote up a report, um, that was, that's used in, um, that's, that's used in a case that is, oh, who is it? It's Curling versus Raffensperger and Judge Amy Totenberg read his report and she was so dismayed by it that she said, seal that report, make it so that nobody can see it. I'm scared that the bad guys will be able to see it and they'll be able to replicate it. And while that sounds like a reasonable thing to do, to, to do, um, Judge Totenberg, I don't think, understood that the bad guys already have that information, you know? Mm -hmm. And what needed to happen was we needed to, it's, you know, what my grandfather and grandmother, you know, said it best, they're like, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant you know what, take that report and air it out so the whole world can see it. Show the world. And, and uh, honestly, D Dominion's, Dominion's system right now is set up so that their, their software is proprietary. It shouldn't be proprietary. They should have it out there so anybody can see it. I have no problem if somebody's going to be administering an election, they're being paid you know, to do that on an annual basis. 
but the software needs to be, you know, needs to be unassailable. It needs to be, you know, viewable by anybody who's an expert to be able to see that it does work, that it does in fact work properly. And um, wasn't his Halderson, I think it's Halderson, right? Halderman. Halderman. Alex, Alex. Was that, is he the, it wasn't he the same person who uh, in the 2016 election, some members of the Senate Democrats that were complaining about, they were, they had this expressed the same concern. Or is that a different person or do you know? I'm not sure who you're talking about. There, I mean, I've, I've in, in this whole journey, I, I went. There was along. a, I think it was a University of Michigan. Um, yeah, the University of Michigan is Holderman, so that it'd be the yes. same person. Yes, yeah. I think it's the same person. Yeah. So but, the I mean, Democrats were expressing the same issues in 2016 that you know was not cool to express in 2020. Yeah, I mean, and and yeah, and so they, I mean. So all this, all this thing about, you know, being called an election denier and that kind of thing. I mean, people need to, you got to turn things around and, and tell people, you know, you're a fraud denier. And if you're a fraud denier, you're a denier of the, of the truth. I mean, we, you know, people, you know, people sometimes, you know, call me like a crazy conspiracy theorist, but the last time I checked um, it's conspiracy theorist seven mainstream media zero is where we are as far as on, on the truth meter. Um, I mean, when I was a kid, when you were a kid, you were told that if you if you if you mentioned anything about UFOs being real and 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 the possibility that there might be life at someplace else, you were considered a crackpot. People lost their jobs. Air Force pilots would you know would would you know would lose their wings you know if they brought those kinds of things up. And now we have the United States Navy saying, "Yep, they're real. We have no idea what they are, but they're there." Right. So, well, I, I do a lot of episodes where the media is lying about one thing or another through um, omission. Yeah. So and we and we've got we've got that going on right now. And I think one of the greatest things that if you're if your viewers don't have a Twitter account, they need to go sign up for a Twitter account and then subscribe to Elon Musk because Musk and his group have been have been. Um, publishing something called the Twitter files. I think they're on episode eight right now or file number eight. And you're, you're literally seeing that Twitter became an arm of the United States government and it was suppressing, you know, um, freedom of speech. And it wasn't accidental or happenstance or anything like that. You know, they're one of their directors of, you know, safety uh, was a guy named Yoel Roth. And in one of his in one of his uh, comments going back and forth on their, you know, on their internal messaging system, he said that they needed to come up with a little bit more opaque way to reference his, um, his the meetings on his calendar because he's definitely not meeting with the FBI, you know, <laughs> when in fact he was. They were doing it on a daily basis. So, I, you know, I'm sure there's some great people, the FBI. But the, the people that were involved in that one are not. And as I think last I heard, there's 75 or 80 people that still work at Twitter that used to work for the FBI, the NSA, the CIA, some, you know, some type of government intelligence agency. And both Facebook and, and Google have got even more. So... You know, you, you we like to think that, you know, that, that we live in this sanitized world where the government wouldn't screw us. And, you know, and we like to I mean, I, I used to think that, you know, that, that I had like the schoolhouse rock, you know, view of the way that, you know, the government worked and elections worked and that kind of thing. And nothing could be further from the truth. It was naive to think that that's been the hardest thing about you know, that's been the hardest pill to swallow about the about this whole journey I've been on. I, I, I can imagine. Have you been following the situation in Arizona at all? Yeah, yeah. So, and and I've got some I've got some uh, some teammates that are actively involved in that and and giving, um, you know, giving testimony. There's um there's a retired there's a retired information technology professor from Texas A and M named named Dr. Or Professor Walter Doherty, and Doherty was asked to take a look at um, at, you know at a at a Mesa County, um, Mesa County, Colorado, um. Uh, uh, server image, a Dominion server image. And what, what he found was one of the most disturbing things I've ever heard of that has not been reported. He found a second database in, in the server where um, 
where basically fake ballot images were stored so that they could then be uploaded undetected, you know, to be mixed in with, with the regular ballot images. I mean, it is astonishing, you know, what's, what's being found out there. And that's just one County server, you know, in one state. And, so, we, and it seems, it seems like the same kind of thing is happening in Arizona too. It's not whether something in, in terms of elections, it's not whether you could prove something happened fraudulently. It's whether it could. I think that's the important distinction. And that's the thing that's so frustrating about people uh, using, throwing around the term election denier when you're simply saying, look, this is a messed up system because it could, you're opening yourself to the fact that people could cheat. Not that they're actually cheating. That's, you know, Michael Bloomberg through supposedly $400 million of election. I mean, it's not beyond <laughs> it, it reason to expect someone, if they threw that kind of money at election, right. could use it for deferry to steal election. So, Well, I mean, when, when you look at elections, I mean, who do, who do elections benefit the most? I mean, why, why would Democrats and Republicans spend half a billion dollars on one Senate seat in Georgia unless it was worth more than that. I mean, I'm an investment professional. You know, to me, it's a simple investment. You're going to, you're investing for a potential return. You wouldn't invest $500 million unless you thought you were going to get more than $500 million worth of return out of it. That's, it's just, I mean, so I, I think, I think the average person just needs to wake up, understand that the systems can be compromised. And, you know, honestly, I, I think that the, the best way to go about, you know, fixing this is, Give us back paper ballots. Let's do hand counts, you know, at the precinct. Have that hand count verified, you know, you know, back at, you know, back at the county. When you vote, vote on a piece of paper where you have to, you know, write down a circle, you know, whoever, whoever your candidate is, put it into a clear, sealed Lexan box so that everybody can see that my ballot went in at 12 o'clock in the afternoon and there was probably about 40 more or 50, you know, 50 more ballots that were in there. And if you have poll observers that, that are there to watch to make sure that things, things are accurate, and if you have a manager and two assistant managers who count things up, you know, if one of us tries to get away with something, you're going to know, you know, plus it's one precinct, you know, with a, with a computer system, you're basically dealing with a black box and anything can happen in the background. Um, you know, just to give, just to give your, you know, when you talk about like how things could happen, we're being asked to prove, you know, you have to, you know, we're being told you have to prove that fraud occurred. And most of the time we can't prove it, you know, all the way down, you know, down to like showing you the piece of paper because nobody will let us see the, will let us touch the ballots. They say that's a felony. You can't touch it. Um, but let me give you, give an example. So in, in Gwinnett or not Gwinnett County in, uh, in Fulton County in 2020, every time that a poll is closed someplace, they're supposed to, um, when the election workers are done, they print out something called a poll tape. And the poll tape shows how many people, you know, cast ballots in that precinct and what the outcome was, like who, who won different races. And when we're done with that, we, we print out three copies. One goes inside the notebook, one goes in with the, with the compact flashcard, one gets posted at the, at the polling place. And then all three people have to sign it. The manager and the two assistant managers have to say, has to have three signatures on it. And I just told all of you that, or told you all of that, because in Fulton County in 2020, we have, we have receipts for 300,000 votes that were cast that have no signatures on the receipts, number one. That's, the most, that's one of the most troubling things. Number two, those receipts were not printed on the machines where the ballots were cast. They were printed at, um, at English Street Warehouse by one individual who printed out all those different receipts for those things. Um, and the Secretary of State says, hey, nothing we can do. It's a violation of state law. It's a violation of you know of Georgia code. Nothing's happened. So yeah, it, 
it, it's it seems just society or U.S. society has gone away from the the media and society is insisting that fraud needs to be proven instead right. of fraud could have happened. Right. Which and, is, and and like like I said before, with like a clear Lexan box, systems. You put your vote in there. No, but there is no way that fraud can happen in in that kind of environment. At least nothing of, of any significance. And in the in the in the precinct where where I was poll manager, we had 350 ballots that day. If we decided we're going to throw all 350 to one person, the three of us colluded together, and we could go to jail for it if one of us ratted the other one out. It's only for 350 votes. Who's going to bother? There's the in, there's no incentive when you have. Um, there's a pretty neat video on YouTube. A gentleman from the UK talks about uh, the idea that there. If you have so many polling places and they're so small that there's no incentive to cheat, right? Yeah, not with, not with human beings counting them. But yeah. again, when you when it when it when everything gets reverted to a black box, like I just told you that we had three hundred thousand ballots where they you know or votes where there there was no no signatures you know on the receipts. For all I know, when those when those receipts were printed out. Anybody could have taken another compact flashcard, you know, slid it in the machine, printed out whatever they wanted to, and then moved on to the next one. It's not that difficult to do that. You're talking about computers. They, they follow our commands of what we want to do. Right. Well, I, I appreciate your time doing this. It's uh, uh, been very informative. What should have I, is there anything you'd like to add? Put it that um, you know, so so we we get we get asked pretty frequently, like you know, what what can I do to help? You know, how can I you know get involved in that kind of thing? And, and what I tell people is that, um, you know, a philanthropist friend of mine said, some people have time, some people have talent, and some people have treasure, and some of us are blessed with all three. Um, we've got some people that have said, I don't have any money, but I really want to be involved and help out. We have a place to help them. They all they have to do is go to voterga.org. And they can, you know, get plugged in over there with Voter GA, and it's very easy for them to figure out like what team that that, that they can help on. Some people are technically oriented; other people are not, and they're more, you know, they're more, you know, um, they're more hands-on, like you know, volunteer base. We need everybody, you know, to be involved in this kind of stuff. Um, so that's that's your, you know, that's your, you know, that's your time and, and that's your talent. And then we've the got folks other- need to understand it's not a partisan group. No, it it is it is not. It is um, you know, <laughs> we're equal opportunity, um, you know, ha- haters on the system, you know, because it's it's terrible. Um, and then the last part is is uh, is if you've been blessed with tr- you know with treasure in your life, please consider making a tax deductible contribution to you know to to voter GA. Um, or if 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 a tax deduction is not important to you, you can you can go to um, you can go to Give Send Go and look up election oversight. And that's a place where we're, we're, we're raising money for some, you know, for a lawsuit that we're going to be filing here pretty soon. Um, there's different ways to help out. And then the last thing I tell people is that, you know, I'm in the wealth management business. If you've got, you know, money with another, you know, with a big wealth management firm that's out there and, you, you know, you feel like they're not treating you right and you want to be part of the selection integrity, stop giving your money, you know, to the enemy because that's what they are. They're supporting, you know, they're supporting all the stuff that that is that's robbing, I think, people of their, you know, of, of their civic abilities. You know, work with a work with an independent advisor. Look us up, you know, you know, feel free to give us a call. Um, we've had so many people that have that have come to us recently that have said, we had one guy that came to us recently that said, I feel like I found my tribe. And that is such an honor and a blessing to be able to work with people that, you know, that appreciate your knowledge and, you know, and appreciate what you're doing. So, and I don't feel like I have to hide out. I mean, if, if I was working at one of the major firms where I worked before, they would have shut me down long ago and said, you cannot be involved in this. Right. Right. That's how well, I, I think it's, I mean, quite a bold uh, thing for you to get involved in and stay involved in. It'd been very easy to not just to, okay, well, I'm good to see I, no, no, I've, I've lost business over this. I mean, I've, I've had, I've had clients that have said, you know, listen, I cannot continue to see you on social media or being interviewed. And, and I can't, I just, I, I can't be involved in this. Um, but fortunately we've, we've had way more people that have come to us that 
than, than, than what we've lost that have said, I want to be involved and I want to be on your team. Uh, that's great. That's great. Well, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it, David. And uh, been watching Different Take podcasts with Bill Griffin. Uh, if you like the content, please subscribe, like, share, comment. Thanks for watching. Thank you.